Welcome to Civil Night. My guest is Apo Sahakyan. He is an Armenian musician and writer from Jerusalem. During the war of last fall, he was volunteering in Artsakh. After the war, he wrote a piece in the Armenian weekly newspaper, which he entitled Our Useless Diaspora, Our Future Armenia. Welcome, Apo, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let me read a quick segment from your article first. If me and my guys were guilty of one thing, it is what everyone else was guilty of. That is, we took Artsakh for granted while enjoying it as a tourist hotspot for its divine beauty. It turned into the background of our social media pictures, but it never made it to the tangible forefront of our daily lives. Can you unpack this for us? Yeah, this statement has to do a lot with the fact that for 30 years after the victory of, of the first war, we sort of retreated into this euphoric uh, la laziness or indifference to actually try to move the diaspora to Armenia. We always found an excuse not to move to Armenia, whether we cited an economic reason or we cited that the Armenians from Armenia are actually leaving Armenia, so why should we, we go there? And, and for 30 years, the diaspora, at, at least the diaspora clique that I come from, we treated our, our, our Armenia either as a touristic spot for the summer, our Armenia that includes Artsakh, we include it as a summertime uh, place to go to, or for the elders, it was a cemetery. Like if I die, take my body to Armenia bur and, and bury me in Armenia. And the diaspora, with all the resources that we had in the, in, in, in the diaspora, we never, we never said to ourselves, okay, the phase is over, this phase of the diaspora is over. It's time that we actualize plans to take the resources of the diaspora and to put it and to move people to Armenia, at least young people that do not have roots in the diaspora, not like our parents, young people like us that we still don't have, uh, as a, in Armenian we say, Dunder, we still don't have homes and all like that. So we could go there, but we never did it. So Artsakh and Armenia remained this close but distant, and we took it for granted until September 2, 2000. Uh, 2020, September 27th, we lost all of that because we just took it for granted and we slept through this euphoric uh, dream that we had for 30 years. Um, but would you say that there is a, a misconception of the Armenian realities, of the country's reality in the diaspora? I think the misconceptions that we have in the diaspora are, are the misconceptions that I believe personally that also the Armenians in, Ar in Armenia have. Uh, for 30 years, we fed ourselves these misconceptions that at last, after 800 years of, of retreating, we had finally won and that we were just going to go for, forward. That, that was it. And for a while, I believe we all lost track of where we lived or of, of where Armenia was. We forgot that we were in the Caucasus. We, we believed that we were in Scandinavia. We, we somehow lost... Uh, we somehow lost our view that we're still surrounded by authorities, I'm not going to say societies or people, but more or less authorities that were tweeting threats against us and us in Armenia and in the, and in the diaspora, we lost sight of where we are and in the diaspora especially because of the distance, that loss of sight was aggravated and uh, we just saw that, you know, uh, Yerevan was doing well, more people had cars and all that. So we said, OK, I think our I think that Armenia is safe, like it should be safe. We took it for granted again in the diaspora and also in Armenia. But me as a diaspora, and I, I, I cannot speak for the Armenians in Armenia as much as I can speak for the diaspora. And that's why my article was intended to the diaspora. Uh, during the war, Armenians in the diaspora uh, were showing their support in various ways, though. Uh, they were demonstrating, raising awareness, they were also showing financial support. Um, did all these actions not have value? I do not. <laughs> okay, this is where my art uh, article probably triggered some people. My whole point was, at the end of the day, it didn't, because we lost. So no matter how rich our diaspora was or how connected they were to the political lobbies of this country and that country, even the Armenia fund, I mean, if you look at it, $150 million, only 30 per, I mean, the Armenians in Armenia paid 30% of that. So the diaspora didn't really pitch it. I can personally tell you, I didn't pitch into the Armenia fund. I pitched in directly to the post that I was on because the checkpoint that we were on was completely abandoned by the government. So we and my guys had to maintain it. 
But the fact was that with all of these resources of the diaspora, we have to admit to ourselves, we failed because uh, we had hundreds of, we had thousands of people flocking the streets of LA, of Paris and all that. The Turks came and took Shushi and Hadrut and uh, and and all of these towns that, 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 that are ours. And it didn't really help. And my point was, we have to get out of this. There is this Armenian misconception, which is always referenced to the Jewish diaspora and Israel. In the in the diaspora and in Armenia, there is always this trend to relate us to the Jewish people and to Israel. But I always tell them, your references are wrong. Take it from me. I actually live in Israel, so I actually know what I'm saying. Israel is not strong because it's a diaspora is strong. The diaspora is strong because Israel is strong. Actually, it it reversed. So they knew that the diaspora had reached the phase where all of the resources should be given to Israel and the country should be strong enough so that the diaspora is strong enough. We still haven't gotten to that point that without a strong without a strong state, the diaspora will never be strong. The the dias we've had we've had countless diasporas throughout the years. They all came to an end. The diaspora that we have now is just another diaspora that will come to an end. And all of those diasporas were strong enough too. Uh, if you talk to the historians in civil net, I'm pretty sure they can tell you we had very strong diasporas in Transylvania, in the Balkans, in Poland. None of that will help. You know why? Because we did not have a country that was strong enough. They all died out and this will die out too. It just doesn't matter. Um, so, as I said, you were on the ground during the war. First question, what were you doing there? Then, uh, when the Armenian and Artsakh government was calling Armenians in the diaspora uh, to come and help in Artsakh, the response was shy. Uh, how would you explain this? Okay, first of all, I volunteered for the MFA, the Armenian Foreign Ministry. Uh, but daytime, during, yeah, we... We divided our tasks with translating for the MFA on, on the border crossing in uh, in Terkur, where the Artsakh and Armenian border meet. And we also went to go, go uh, we also went to Goris and we helped out the refugee families there because I come from a scout background and me and my guys are scouts. So we went, we helped out the kids. As for the diaspora response to look. Uh, here you can also blame both sides. The diaspora is comf comfortable. I'm not saying I'm not going to say they're comfortable, but they're at a distance. Uh, they couldn't come as much as they want. They're also not fighters. I mean, again, uh, somebody living in the Caucasus is much more prone to picking up a gun than somebody living in Paris. So I do not, I do not see the warrior spirits of Armenians in Paris as much as I see it in Armenia. Right? So I don't, you know. But at the same time, we cannot. We. We, we cannot negate the fact that the government was just, was just tripping one day after the next, just trying to come up with a response to what was happening. And one day they called out the diaspora, come help me. One day they called out the like the Qutsis, the villagers, come help us. There is blame to, to, to go on both both sides. At, at the end of the day, uh, we completely failed as a nation because of our disillusions, because of our illusions, because of our delusions. And... Uh, and the lack of response, and then the breakdown of the u of the the unity that we have. We've always had this perception that Armenians are a unified nation. We have this mythology mythological perception of our unity that completely broke down because on all sides we had shortcomings that we were not willing to address for all these years. Uh, in the opinion you shared on the Armenian Weekly, you say that all is not lost, though. Uh, Armenians throughout the world and Armenians in Armenia have uh, a chance to develop the country. Uh, should Armenians leave behind Armenians in the diaspora? I mean, should they uh, leave behind what they built in another country and come to Armenia? If not, what do you imagine that could be done? Okay, I'm not the king of Armenia, so I cannot tell them what to do exactly, but... But you wrote a, 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 a sentence about this, right? Yeah, 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 I did, I did. But, and my point was, if you care about Armenia and if you care about our collective and if and if you care about the future of Armenia, and I'm not talking as an extreme na na nationalist, I'm, I'm just talking as somebody that loves Armenia because it's ours, it's our small corner in this world of other peoples, right? If we really care about it, then we have to realize that the number one problem of Armenia is the demographics. And right now, if the if the lockdown is over, the corona lockdown, other people are going to leave Armenia. The immigration and the exodus is going to start again. 
And that is only another chance for us to lose what we actually have, you know. And if we really care about it, this is our last stand. This is our last stand because for 800 years, our our homeland has been getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And now, and right now, it's just a slight piece of line that you cannot even see on a map. And we're about to lose that too because our minions are not getting one small thing. We need demographics. We need to put people in Armenia. We need to put Armenians on Armenian soil. It, you cannot tell me that you're fulfilling a national obligation by being an Armenian on American soil or French soil or Arab soil. I do not really care about that. I have always told people my national patriotism or whatever my work is for Armenians that live on Armenian soil, including Armenians that live in Armenia and Artsakh, even Jawakh maybe, right? These are people that are living in Armenia so because that is the only way that we can strengthen in Armenia and have and have a future. Whether you want, whether you're afraid or you have an excuse not to leave Glendale and the millions that you're making in New York, well, that means that at a certain point you are prioritizing your your material needs over your Armenian identity. So, but I'm not saying leave your millions. What I'm saying is then do not talk about your patriotism. Resign from it because you're just an added weight that I cannot afford right now. Let me focus on people that actually do want to make Armenia stronger. All right. And uh, Apo, do you plan to come and live in Armenia soon? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just here because the airport is locked down. Corona, Morona, Kidas. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I can't say all that and not put my money where my mouth is. Right. That's why. Thank you very much, Apo, for this talk. Thank you. Thank you for watching and continue to follow CivilNet.